The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear The Secret to Success When Dealing with Failure and Consequences You've failed. Now what? Today we're going to look at a lesson that won't be dealing with what caused you to fail. This lesson assumes that you have failed. And so the question is, now what? Of course, we're talking about spiritual failure. If you need to deal with failure, it's because you have sinned. You've committed an act of sin. That could be a sin of commission. In other words, you've done something you should not have. Or a sin of omission. You should have done something, but left it undone. So you've sinned. You failed. The question is, now what? The first thing that we need to do when dealing with failure and consequences is admit it. Recognize the sin and admit it. Sin is rebellion against God, and God knows that you've sinned. He is omniscient and all-knowing. You cannot hide sin from Him. You know that you've sinned. God knows that you've sinned. Now you need to admit it. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, let's look at verse 13. Here, David has committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba, and then to try to cover up the pregnancy that resulted, he tried to get Bathsheba's husband killed and ended up doing so. And now in 2 Samuel 12:13, he has been accused of sin by Nathan. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. David did what he was supposed to do, and that's simply admit it. God knew that he had sinned. That's why Nathan was there, to say, God knows what you have done. And David admitted it. We need to recognize the shame. Shame is one of the consequences of sin. It comes with the territory. You need to recognize it and accept it. Shame is actually a good thing because it shows an understanding that you have done wrong. Let's look at the book of Zephaniah in the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 5. There we read this. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. Did you see that? The unjust knoweth no shame. Those that do wicked don't feel shame if they have seared their conscience. If they do not believe that God is true or that the Bible is true, they do it because they want to do it, and the sin that they do does not cause them to shame. How many in our world today openly sin and are not ashamed of it, but are even proud of it, proud that they are doing something that is contrary to God's will? When we feel shame because of sin, that can be a good thing because it shows that we understand what we did was wrong. So we need to recognize the shame and accept it. One time when I was talking at a congregation, someone mentioned the idea that, well, we don't have to have people come forward to admit their sin. That might cause them shame. Well, whether they come forward or not, they need to admit their sin, and they need to recognize the shame. My response to that person was, shame comes with sin. Shame comes with repentance. You would not repent of something if you didn't feel shame for it. Why would you repent of something if you didn't feel sorry for it or if you didn't have shame because of it? We're not trying to ask people when they sin to come up front so that we can make fun of them or ridicule them. We ask them to let us know that they have sinned and to admit it because this is the first step in the healing process. Admit that what you did was wrong and turn back to God and his law and his commandments. And yes, there will be shame, but I have shame when I sin. Everyone should have shame when they sin because it helps us to understand this was wrong. It helps us to feel sorry and regretful so that maybe we'll learn from it and not do it again. 
If you sin, you need to say that you're sorry. If it's a public sin, then it should be followed with public confession. If you've openly shamed the church or brought reproach upon it, then admit it and say to the church openly and in public, I'm sorry. If it's something that you've done between an individual and yourself, then go to that individual and say, I'm sorry for what I've done. And then if it's something private that only God knows about, then say you're sorry to God. We should say we're sorry to God when we sin at any time, but we should also acknowledge the fact that we have sinned, and sometimes that affects other people. And if that's the case, we need to say that we're sorry to those people. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 8. If you'll open your Bibles there to 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. One of the reasons we need to say we're sorry and admit that we've sinned is because God knows that we've sinned, and if we act and pretend like we didn't sin, then aren't we really calling God a liar? God is saying, you've sinned and you've done wrong. But if we act as if, no, we really didn't sin, and no, I don't have to say I'm sorry, I can just forget about it, well, God is standing there waiting for you to say sorry to him. Are you going to call him a liar and say that you have not sinned? If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. God knows that you've sinned. You need to openly admit, I have sinned, and say that God is truthful and I was wrong. So what does confession really do? Why is it so important? Why should I admit when I have failed? Well, first of all, it gets rid of the elephant in the room. You know what that phrase means. When there's something like an elephant in the middle of the living room and people act like it's not really there, it's just ludicrous. If you quit coming to church and you've committed adultery and everybody in the public knows about it and you've moved in with somebody and lived in sin that you shouldn't be living with, if you come back to church and act as if nothing has ever happened, everybody knows the elephant is in the room. Everybody knows what is going wrong. Everybody knows what has happened. God knows you've sinned. You know you've sinned. If it's public, other people know you have sinned too. So confession acknowledges that. It allows us to heal, to get forgiveness, and to move on so that we can forget about it and go on with our lives. It also gives glory to God as the one who is right. It tells others, including those who may not understand or who may be unlearned, that what you did was wrong, and it's not an example to be followed. Confessing that you have sinned actually lets other people know, I was wrong, don't do what I did. Other people are watching you and learning from your example. If you confess that what you did was wrong, then they can learn, oh, maybe that's something I should not imitate. Confession and asking for forgiveness allows God and others to have a chance to forgive you. We want to forgive those who are willing to repent and say, I'm sorry. But if they never do, or if they act as if they aren't sorry, how can I forgive them if they don't even acknowledge the sin? Repentance and confession and asking for forgiveness finishes your responsibility for sin and leaves the ball in others' courts. In other words, let's say you've done something wrong, and then you go to the other people and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Well, the responsibility is now off your shoulders. The responsibility is now on the other people to forgive you. And maybe some people will choose not to forgive you, but if they do, there's nothing really that you can do about that. It's their choice. You've said you're sorry, you've fulfilled your responsibility, and now you can be healed and move on. The good news is God has promised to forgive those who are willing to obey him and ask for forgiveness. Others may or may not forgive, but that's their decision. And if they do not forgive, that's their sin that they will have to answer to God about. Let's look at Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. We want to be able to forgive. And when you go to someone and ask for forgiveness, they have that great opportunity to forgive you. 
If they choose not to do it, that's something they'll have to answer to God for. But if you've asked for forgiveness and admitted it, you have done your responsibility, and God is said that he is willing to forgive you. Next, you need to examine it. Examine the failure. This is the meaning of repentance. Repentance means a change of mind which leads to a change of action. But how do we come to a change of mind and a subsequent change of action if we do not examine what was wrong with us that caused us to sin in the first place? When we examine what we have done wrong, we may find out what caused ourselves to do that in the first place. We must examine why we did what we did. We don't need to just examine what sin we did, but why did we do it? Some of the root causes of sin are selfishness or the love of money, covetousness. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 lets us know this. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You've probably heard people say money is the root of all evil, but that's not what the Bible says. Money is just pieces of paper and coins are just pieces of metal. That's not evil. What's evil is loving that money and putting that first. The love of money is the root of all evil. So maybe we steal and we say, okay, I stole and that was a sin. I shouldn't do that anymore. But we should also examine why did I steal? Why did I do this sin? Was it for covetousness, the love of money? Maybe I've got something else going on inside my head that I need to deal with to keep me from stealing. Yes, I can say I'll never steal again, but what if I still love money and I, and I cheat on my taxes? What if I try to overtake somebody in the corporate ladder and lie about somebody else in order to get a better job? Because I love money. I might end up doing multiple sins because I still have the love of money, even though I stopped stealing. There's all kinds of things that could come from a root cause of sin, such as selfishness or the love of money. The Bible says the love of the money is the root of all evil. All sorts of evil will come from that love of money. So we need to examine ourselves and say, why did I do this sin in the first place? What's wrong with me and my thinking? Was it fear? Was I selfish? Was I covetous? What was causing me to sin, and what can I do to get rid of it? What did I hope to gain from doing this sin? What does it say about me that I put that before God? Why would it have been better if I had obeyed God? Maybe my sin actually shows another problem, like lack of trust in God. Maybe I stole money because I didn't know if I was going to make the rent or to be able to pay the bills or survive. Does my sin show a lack of trust in God? Maybe it shows too much desire for earthly things and not enough for heavenly things. Once we understand what we have done, now we must set about fixing the root causes. This might include Bible study, counseling with a fellow Christian or with someone that is trustworthy and honest, help from a fellow Christian just to give you moral support and encouragement and to talk to you, or whatever it takes. Sinning to gain money shows a desire for earthly things or may show a lack of trust in God. So we might study the parable of the rich man who built barns. Read about heaven and compare the riches of that place to the earth. Read about Jesus and his poverty and his servitude. And maybe that will help us to gain the proper perspective. Another example might be that engaging in sexual sins may show an area where you are weak spiritually. Maybe we should study the Bible's commandments on sexual sins. Keep your mind on pure things, including pure entertainment. Talk to a fellow Christian. Ask him to call you once a day to check on you so you have an earthly person to answer to. Do what it takes to examine the root causes of the sin and then to address that. Christians should look upon the opportunity of helping others avoid the bondage of Satan as an opportunity. In James chapter 5, let's read verse 20. James chapter 5 and verse 20. There we read, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. We need to reach out and help each other and to examine the root causes of our sin so that we can help each other make it to heaven. Next, what we need to do is step up and step on it. Step up and step on it. Let's break those down into two individual things. First, step up. Step up. Gird up your loins like a man and admit it. When you failed, 
step up and say, yes, I was wrong. I admit it. Let's look at the book of Job, chapter 38. Job chapter 38, starting in verse 1. If you remember what happens, Job has all sorts of calamities that happens to him, and he finally gets so frustrated that he basically turns his attention to God and asks that age-old question, Why me? Why is this happening to me? And in Job chapter 38, starting in verse 1, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Well, that's what we need to do when we fail. Job was wrong for pointing his angry finger at God. God would certainly not abandon him, and God would certainly take care of him. Job had a lack of trust in God, and perhaps a frustration out of all the things that were happening, and thinking that he knew better than God. So God said, you gird up your loins like a man. You recognize your mistake here, Job, is what he has an opportunity to do. And when we fail, we need to gird up our loins like a man and step up and say, I was wrong. I admit it, and I'm ready to take the consequences for it. And some of those consequences might be here on earth, too. Even though God may forgive us of sin, we still may have to face earthly consequences. So we need to recognize those consequences and accept them. See, the devil is only selling you the pleasure of sin. He doesn't show you the fine print of consequences. He shows you the pleasure of doing illegal drugs and and the pleasure that you're going to get. He doesn't show you the five years in prison that you may have to spend if you even survive. He may show you the wonderful lifestyle of living with all this money and women and and all these pleasures, but he doesn't show you the consequences of when you embezzle money from the company and get sent to prison. Even if you get forgiveness from someone, including God, there still may be earthly consequences to pay, such as prison, a damaged marriage, lost friendship. Let's look at Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. You know, there's a law of nature that we know of called what you sow, that you're going to reap. When you sow corn in the field, you're going to reap corn. And that's no different when we sow sin. When we sow sin, we're going to reap sin, and we're going to face the consequences. So we need to stand up and face it and say, I was wrong and I'm ready to accept the consequences. And we need to be a good example to others. We can pray to God and ask others for mercy, but you still might have earthly consequences to pay. If so, stand up and take your medicine. Show everyone that God was right and not a liar. Admit your mistakes. Confess that God is good. And as long as the Lord has forgiven you, any earthly consequences you may face are really only temporary. Romans chapter 8. Let's read verse 18. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul knew it. Paul knew that even if I have to suffer, even if I have to go through all kinds of bad consequences here on earth, it's not going to compare to the glory and the reward that awaits in heaven. So even if you have to face some bad earthly consequences here on earth, step up and say, God was right. God was the truthful one. I was the one who did wrong. Everybody who's listening to me, listen, don't do what I did, because look at what happens. I have to face these consequences, and I have to face the shame of the sin that I've done. Try to make up for the wrong if you can. Zacchaeus said he would pay back fourfold to any man he had taken by false accusation. What a noble spirit, and Jesus was pleased when he heard this attitude coming from Zacchaeus, saying that I have done wrong, I have sinned, he admitted it, and then said, I will try to make amends and show his repentance to these people that he had wronged. What a good attitude. Next, besides stepping up, we need to step on it. And what I mean by that is use the mistake as a stepping stone to rise to new heights. You know, the best thing I've learned to do with mistakes in life is learn from it and grow. You've failed, you've sinned, and you've made a mistake. But guess what? It's in the past. You can't go back and change it. You can't go back and fix it. All you can do is now say, well, what can I do to improve myself, 
to do better so that I won't do it anymore, so that I won't fail again. Failure can be one of the best ways to learn. Now, I'm not advocating that you go out and sin in order to fail, in order to learn. But if you do face the idea that you have failed, then you can say, well, now I have a great opportunity to learn why I failed. I'm going to examine it to learn why I did this. I'm going to learn how to do better. We certainly can learn the easy way or the hard way. And if we fail, we've learned the hard way. But there are easier ways to learn by reading God's Word and trying to live according to that so that we don't have to fail and learn the easy way. But if you do face failure, at least admit it and say, now I'm going to step up and admit it, and now I'm going to step on it and rise to new heights. I've done something wrong, but I can learn from it, and I can grow as a Christian. If we do not study history, we're doomed to repeat it. You've probably heard that before. But think of how many things are even going on in the world that are sinful, that we can read of in the Bible, that people were punished for, that they were destroyed for. And yet people even today are not learning from that history. They're not learning from those mistakes of the past. And they're rejoicing in their sin without shame. In Galatians chapter 6, let's read verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now that you've realized you failed, step up, step on it, rise to new heights, but also think about how you can help others who may have made the same mistake or may be about to make it. You can talk to them with first-hand experience. What a wonderful use of a failure. If you were an alcoholic and you've overcome drinking, how you can warn other people about the dangers and the sin of drinking. How you can tell them, look at what happened to me. Don't even start down that road. If you have overcome drug addiction, how wonderful you can talk with experience to other people and say, I did this and it was wrong. Don't do this. I know what will happen. You can counsel people. You can help people. You can use that failure to help other people. If you are overtaken in a fault such as we read about in Galatians 6, if those people who are Christians will help you and restore you, then you can help other people as well. In the same chapter, Galatians chapter 6, notice verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. That's another thing that we have to do is step up, step on it, and don't quit. Let's look at the sin from God's perspective. God does not desire you to be condemned because of your sin. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why he sent Jesus. He wants you to have an opportunity to be saved. But God desires you to turn from your sin and get on with your life. He doesn't want you to quit. Notice John chapter 8 starting in verse 3. John chapter 8, starting in verse 3. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What was Jesus' attitude to someone who had sinned? She was not only someone who had sinned, she was taken in the very act of sin. But Jesus' attitude was, Move forward. Go ahead. Don't quit. Go. Sin no more. Do better. Learn from your mistakes. Don't repeat it. That's what Jesus said. God's answer to the faithful who sin and then repent, then confess it and ask for forgiveness, 
and keep walking in the light, what is God's answer? Forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7-9 through 9. When you quit, the devil wins. The devil would be happy if you would just sit beside the road and say, I quit. I can't be perfect. I've failed. I'm never going to make it. I quit. As soon as you do that, the devil wins. As we finish up the lesson, think about two examples of Judas and David. Here's a guy, Judas, who has sinned. He's betrayed Jesus. And then he does some good things. He admitted his wrongdoing. He admitted it. He stepped up. He said, here's this money back that I've taken. You take it back. He confessed the innocence of the one he betrayed. He stepped up and said, Jesus was innocent and I have betrayed him. And perhaps he saw that the earthly consequences of his betrayal were not going to be stopped. So he had turned his failure into something good. He said, I was wrong. Jesus was right. God is right. Here's the money back. I return the money. I'm trying to repent and do what's right. But then he despaired. He did not step on the sin and rise to new heights. He let it drag him down in despair, and he killed himself. He quit. He gave up. Do you think Jesus would have been willing to forgive Judas? I think Jesus, if he was willing to die on the cross for even those who were in the middle of crucifying him, he would certainly have been willing to forgive Judas if Judas had only not despaired and not quit. David, on the other hand, had sinned, and when he found out about it, he admitted it. He said, I've sinned against the Lord. He examined it. He repented and turned to God and said, I've done wrong. He prayed to God for mercy from his earthly consequences of sin. He stepped up. He accepted the consequences when they came. He stepped up and, and received those consequences. And then he stepped on it. He arose. He went on with life. He went on with an eternal perspective and said, I have done wrong, but I'm going to keep going. And he was later described as a man after God's own heart. He didn't quit. What are you doing with your sin? What are you doing with your failures and the consequences that come? Acknowledge that God is true. Acknowledge that God is right. Learn from your mistakes. Admit them. Confess them. Learn from them. And go and sin no more. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Day by day and with each passing moment, Strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure, Truth for the World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world.